And you wanted to write about this story because you viewed it as a real turning point, didn't you? I, I viewed it as a turning point, and it was one of those things. I covered so many things, and I was at the Pentagon at the time, and I'd covered day after day after day, you know, weapons of mass destruction, policy changes, uh, Fallujah had happened, and, and the contractors were killed. All these things, but, but we hadn't really looked at, at what it was like to be there and fight. And, and we'd forgotten about that. I mean, certainly you'd got some coverage in, but, but to really drill down into a battle and how that affected those soldiers. And then one of the soldiers, I kept going back and he said, oh, you have to talk to our families. If you think it's bad for right. us. And there was a, a colonel who burst into tears sobbing. I mean, he was so embarrassed by this during the interview because he just brought up his family and the toll it had taken on the families. And that's when I went and I wanted to, to talk to the families and jump back and forth what that battle was like. For, for and, the, and that is amazing how you jump back and forth between the families and then back to the military. How did you get all, reconstruct all the dialogue? I mean, you have all this dialogue in the, in the tanks and everything. Some of it is, you know, full of epithets and everything. Through interviews. <laughs> okay. And, and yeah. interview, I, I also, I will just say, I had a great researcher who helped me follow up with all this. And it was a, it was a great, <laughs> crazy routine. The, I would work full time, and by the time I started writing the book, I had just switched to the White House. So I had a new beat, and I would be on the air every day, and at seven o'clock, when the, when World News was over, I'd go you back to my office and write till one or two Amazing. in the morning. And the great thing was email. You know, um, Shane Aware, the, the lieutenant who was the platoon leader who was pinned down in this alley, was in Afghanistan by the time I started writing. And I'd email Shane, and I'd say, so Shane, what side do you sleep on when you're in the sleeping bag? And I know this, you know, how do you put your knees, and, is, and how do you remember the dialogue? And, or I'd, uh, you know, I'd email or call another one of them and say, tell me how this would have happened. And, I mean, clearly the dialogue, I mean, they're remembering dialogue. It's not like we were there and remember exactly. But I'd always check and say, is this the kind of, you know, is this what you said? Is this, you know, is this accurate? And we'd, and we'd uh, take it from there. Oh, fortunately, we're rapidly running out of time, but I want to talk about the Mahdi Army. We've got a uh, photograph of the Mahdi Army, uh, Muqtada al-Sadr, MAS, as he's also known. Um, been quiet lately, but always an impending threat. Always an impending threat, and the smartest military people I ever talked to over there said, don't, don't think that in two seconds he couldn't turn this back right. around again. I mean, it has been very calm there, but and, and you know, you have a lot of civilians joining in, and that's what the battle was that night. We hear the word insurgent all the time. Sometimes I think to myself, though, what if our country, somebody had come in and decided our president was bad, removed him or her, taken over? Would, would we be calling the people fighting back insurgents, or would we be calling them patriots? I, I, I think one of the things you have to see is the difference is over there it's not on, it's not what they're doing on their own sometimes they're forced to do it and and you know enough about that area of the world right. and a lot about that area of the world to know that that's what happens often it's a dual existence you may you may see someone in the streets of some of these places saying one thing but they believe another um, we have a photograph of an alley where the battle took place and I know you revisit this alley as often as you can um, that tall building in the back, the tallest one you see is where the platoon was pinned down, and, and they is, ended up making their way to the This gives you a, a touch point to see, how, are things improving, are they not improving, to go back to the same place over and over again. It, it does, and there are times over the years, if I, if I just looked at how I was responded to in that alley, or whether I could even go there, and there have been times where I couldn't go there. And it's uh, what I tell my fellow reporters who haven't covered Iraq quite as much. I said, look, they might take you into Sadr City, but they're not going to take you into the nasty parts of Sadr City. And, and you know, for a long time they've cleaned up. I, I've seen this happen again and again. I've seen them clean up parts of Sadr City, and then it goes back mm -hmm. downhill. I mean, in the end, the end of the first cavalry deployment then, they had Sadr City in pretty good shape and then it goes downhill again. I mean, it's in pretty good shape now. I was there just a couple of months ago. And, and I understand and um, the, the book, and I wish we had longer time to talk about it. It's a fabulous book. I recommend that you read it. Um, it been, has been optioned. It has. It has. It's been optioned for a movie. It was, right, it, it was actually right away um, a really wonderful producer named Mike Metavoy, who has years and years of experience in Hollywood, optioned the book. Um, he saw me speak at the Council on Foreign Relations, read it, and called me a few days later. Um, I, I think Mike knows there's Iraq fatigue, right? but I think he's committed to this. 
and he's hired a screenwriter, and the screenwriter just went to Fort Hood and interviewed a lot of the people there, and, and Colonel Valesky, who um, mm -hmm. was the battalion commander, and he's the one going back. How again exciting. It's ex I, I, I want their story to be told, and I really, I mean, they're approaching it like a documentary. They're approaching it like a real story, and I know, you know, obviously. And you won't be in it. No, 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 I won't be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not in the book. No, no, I'm not I mean, in the book, you, but no, that's no. The, that I'm was a big part of it, yeah. Yeah, I'm consulting on it, but, um, and the, the screener is named Miko Alon, and he's, he's terrific. You haven't just been to Iraq. You've been spending time in Pakistan. You've been spending time in Iran. Um, we've got some footage from Pakistan as, as we start to close here. I mean, this, this has to be one of the linchpin areas, and of course that's why you're going. Um, I, I think it is. If there is another 9-11 plot being hatched, it is happening in those hills. And, and that is another, I, when I go over and I try to go back to the same places, this, I went to Peshawar this time, and last time I went to Peshawar in the, in the Swat Valley, and Peshawar now is completely encircled by the Taliban, completely encircled. And this is a major city in Pakistan. This is a major thriving area of commerce. We're seeing all the violence here. And you these suicide bombings, I walked around the Marriott Hotel, it's just tragic. <sighs> and when you, when you look at, it, at the Marriott, I, I think that's kind of a turning point too. Certainly, whoever drove that truck, as one analyst told me, was driving it right into the west, but they were also driving it into the Pakistani elite. And that raises awareness and it also what I worry about is then they start saying you know what it's America's fault that they're coming after right. us now and and that is something I think the next president really really has to be aware of that and the fact that we've given 10 billion dollars to them and we don't really know where it is is uh do you think that's where Osama bin Laden is in I, Pakistan? I think every analyst you talk to says that he's in Pakistan um I think the president said it in the last interview I was with. This is uh, before Benazir Bhutto was killed. You had an opportunity to talk to her I from did. a distance. I uh, did. Do you think her husband's going to be able to? Uh, I, I think he faces run. some serious, serious challenge. He has a that's yes. <laughs> she, she's asking. She's answering a question to me. We were. I was actually sitting on an armored, an, an armored personnel carrier. <laughs> I happened to be there when they declared a state of emergency. Um, I, uh, w uh, U.S. official jokes that if, if our intelligence community would just get my travel schedule, they'd save a lot of money on intelligence. But they, they, they literally, I, I arrived in Pakistan, I was on my way into Afghanistan, and then heard uh, that they were going to declare a state of emergency the next day, so stayed. And then Benazir Bhutto returned. And um, we were camped outside. I was, I was talking to her on a cell phone at first, and I said, are you going to come out? She said, I'm going to try again. I'm going to come out. I mean, that, it's so tragic because even then, and that was November, um, last November, that uh, you really had a sense that the security could not help her, that no matter how hard they tried, something was probably going to happen to her because she was so exposed. And, and you know, frankly, you just you can't protect against everything. Well, someone who's traveled to this region several times and hopes to go back, I want to thank you for your work in keeping foreign affairs, international issues, uh, top of the docket. Thanks it's so, so much. important, I believe, and I know you do too, for people to know our place in the world and other people's place in the world as well. Thank you for what you do. Thanks, and I know you're committed to it here at well, PBS. Thank, thank you. you very much. You've been listening to Martha Raddatz, Senior White House Correspondent for ABC News. Thanks for joining us. We hope you'll tune in again for another edition of Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.